Thank you for joining us for this week's message at Crosswind Church. If you have any questions about this message or about Crosswind Church, please visit us at www.crosswindchurch.net or you can email us at info at crosswindchurch.net. Well, good morning, y'all. Uh, my name is Jeremy, and I'm the pastor here. I'm so, so glad that you're here with us as we enter into the Christmas season. If you believe it's the Christmas season, I, I say that kind of loosely because, in my opinion, I'm just going to gonna go, go on record. If you've been here for a little while, you know this about me. Um, the Christmas season is way too long, in my opinion, a month. I think Christmas needs a month. That's, that's what I want to give Christmas, the month of December. But, but we kind of keep wanting to push it farther and farther, don't we? I mean, like, my wife, we, we, she loves Christmas, all things Christmas. She, we put up our Christmas tree in the middle of November. Uh, that bothers me just a little bit, right? But I'm willing to kind of, she goes Black Friday shopping. In fact, her mother, she gets it from her mom. Her mom would start buying Christmas presents in the summertime, right? If you guys did that, that's, that's totally fine if you want to be a part of Al-Qaeda or whatever, like I was just saying, that's like really weird, um, but like they do that sort of thing, and, and it bothers me because like you just keep pushing it farther and farther back, there are Christmas uh, radio shows, excuse me, radio programs, radio stations that play Christmas music in the summer, no, uh, no, that, that there are only 12 Christmas songs, everybody sings them over and over again and records your own Christmas album, I don't want to hear those. In June, like it's just wrong. My birthday, September. You should, my birthday should be a whole month, September. Halloween is in October. Thanksgiving in November. And then when November is over, like you notice, we didn't even decorate for Christmas here at the church until December because that's what Jesus would have wanted. Um, <laughs> it's, it's because, like, it gets a month. You get a month. That's, that's what I want Christmas to kind of have is this month. So we're entering into the Christmas season, the time of year where we celebrate the birth of Jesus. Our Lord and our Savior, it's really a neat time. Uh, but, but what if I were to tell you that, like, there was one guy, I want, I want to kind of mention him briefly, there was one guy that took this starting Christmas thing early, way too extreme. He was a prophet in the nation of Israel, and his name was Isaiah. And he actually, 700 years before Jesus was born, started talking about Jesus. 700. Now that's like that's like a bit extreme, but he starts telling us about this child that was going to be born. This this Jesus was going to be born. And in his prophecy, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 6, it says this: For to us a child is born, for to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now, if we could kind of transport ourselves back uh, a couple thousand years, we would start to see something when it came to names. We would see that names were really super important. Now, before you send me emails, I'm not trying to say that what you named your precious little child wasn't important to you. Of course it was. Like, you, you know, when Jody and I were having babies, we got books. Uh, you know, it's not that we didn't have the internet. We just were nerds. We bought books and baby names. And we went online and looked for baby names. But here were our criteria. Well, here's my criteria for what we named our kids. I wanted it to sound good together, like first, middle, and last name. I wanted it all kind of flow. Uh, and, and I didn't want kids to make fun of their name later in life. That was my primary responsibility, was Jody would pick a name, and I would go, this is how her friends would make fun of her when she's in high school. And so, like, names matter. They're important. I get that. But if we were to transport ourselves back 2,000 years, names meant so much more. In fact, even if we were just to go to the East, uh, uh, today, we would see an important names told us something about that baby. Names told us, in some cases, some things about about uh, their their family or about the circumstances that surrounded their birth. So Abraham was named Abraham by God because he was the father of many. That's what his name means. His son Isaac was named Isaac because Isaac means uh, he laughed. Which is what Sarah did when she found out that she was going to have a baby uh, when she was uh, over 90 years old. And so uh, she laughed, and so that's the name of her son. And, and so when Isaiah kind of tells us about this baby, he gives us a little bit of insight into something here. He says, that is why this baby is going to be called, and then he gives us four names. Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Because these names meant something to Isaiah, because they meant something to the readers that read this originally, 
And because I think they mean something to us today, for the next few weeks, as we go into the Christmas season, we're going to take a look at how Jesus fulfilled each of these names. How he came to be the Prince of Peace, and how he came to be and show us about the mighty God, and how he came to be the everlasting Father. And today we get to kind of start by talking about how, how he was and is a wonderful counselor. Now, I struggle with this one just a little bit. Um, and, and I'll just kind of tell you a little bit about it. I, I, there are times, and I'm going to tell you why I struggle with it. There are times when I think about God as my counselor, and as I think about him as a wonderful counselor, that I find such joy in it. There's other times where I kind of get frustrated by it. I think the reason that I struggle with Jesus as my counselor is that I've, I've kind of struggled with counselors here on this earth. So I, I can remember when, when uh, Jody and I had gotten married, we were about in that time period, about four to six years of being married, um, and, and we were undergoing a lot of just stuff. Um, so Jody's mom had uh, been diagnosed with breast cancer and had been through surgeries and chemos, and um, she was entering into her second bout with that cancer. It was that bout that ultimately would take her life. She died in November of 06, and... and uh, in the middle of that, I was trying to finish up seminary. We were 800 miles away from, uh, from family. I was trying to finish up seminary. I was working full-time at a church and, and taking a full load of master's levels classes. And, 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 and I was trying to figure out where God wanted us to serve. When I graduated, there were churches that were interviewing us. And, and, and if we were going to stay there, we had to buy a house. And so we were, we were you know, looking at those uh, our friends were all starting to kind of expand their families, and so we were praying through and thinking through and actually having our first child in that same time period. And, and you add to that, this is about the time that my parents were getting remarried. It, it, this was maybe one of those pivotal moments in my life when, when I was about 24 years old or so, my parents had gotten divorced. Um, it was really a, it really was a blow to me. Personally, I was an only child, and and, uh, and so I really wrestled with and struggled with that. But now they were getting remarried in this time period and, and kind of moving forward with their lives and, and making decisions to, to adopt kids and all sorts of things like that. It was really, really, really trying on us. We just had this kind of perfect storm of just stuff, just life that was going on. And the tension levels just kind of raised in our home. I was also battling a back infection. We, we didn't know it was an infection at the time. We thought it might have been cancer. We thought it might be something else. But uh, down in my, uh, in my lumbar vertebrae, I, I, I had this fungal infection. And so I was getting IV meds pumped into me. There was just a nightmare of, of events that was going on for this period of time in our life. And so the tensions were right, you know, like, like just really on edge. We were always really on edge in our house. Maybe you guys have experienced that. Maybe you're experiencing that right now in your family. Things were just hard. They, they weren't like I felt like they should be. And Jody felt the same way. And, and, and we were, you know, we're both just passionate people. There was just a lot of just, you know, we were just mad. Like our, our marriage wasn't in trouble and we weren't thinking about getting a divorce that I'm aware of. She hasn't told me anything. Anyway, like, we weren't thinking about that, but, but like, but like we, just, we just were mad, we were just unhappy. We couldn't communicate. Communication had broken down between us, and we were just bearing the burden and the weight of the world, it felt like. And I can remember when Jody came to me, and she said, Jeremy, I really think like we, we should go and, and talk to a counselor. It really was like we should go and, 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 and seek somebody that could, 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 you know, help us through this. And I just was not for that. I had begged my parents years before when I went through the divorce to go to counseling, and they had refused. I don't know if it was because of that. I don't know if it was because I was afraid of what people might think about me, that, that, that we were crazy, or, or maybe it was because I dealt with so many other couples as I would counsel them, and I saw our situation was bad, but it wasn't near compared to what some of that was, and, 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 and so I put that off. It was going to cost us. We might have to find you know, babysitters for our kids, and it was just, I don't know, but I think in hindsight, looking back, this is just me. I, the real problem that I had with it was this. To, to go ask for help meant that I had to give up. It meant that I had to admit I couldn't do it on my own. I couldn't fix it. I couldn't fix her, and I couldn't fix me, and I couldn't fix our circumstances. And it kind of just felt like this, this flag of surrender. So we finally did. We went to go see a counselor, and, 
And, and I'll tell you, immediately I found out, immediately I found out, it, it was not about, about my giving up or my being weak. It was not about me being crazy, although I was, right? It, it was nothing about that. It was about me. It was, it was about me not having the right tools in my toolbox to be able to manage everything and to handle everything. And to have somebody just that was a non-partial third party look at us and go, oh, well, yeah, listen, I get it. Here's some things you can try. Here's some tools you can have. Here's some help. And it changed everything. And I can remember thinking, man, I'll never be afraid to do this again. Like, and we are. We, we've been to counseling several times. And the thing I want you to know is this. Like, from time to time, you, you may need to go and sit down with somebody. From time to time, it's awesome to go and, and, and to just share your burdens with someone and, and have an impartial third party. So, like, when, when your wife comes and looks at you and says, the marriage is over. Or when the, when the doctor says, listen, it's cancer and it's inoperable. Or when the bank account hits zero and the, and the bank says, we're not going to loan you any more money. When the dean of your school comes to you and says, you can't come back anymore. When, when it's the end of the semester and you know that grades are coming home and you know mama's not going to be happy. Right, come on. When the relationship ends, when the relationship is severed, when, when, when the, the luck runs out, if you will, when it's time to declare bankruptcy, when Auburn loses the SEC championship, there's always a time when you might want to, to sit down and, and chat with a counselor. And listen, let me tell you something. There's some really, really good counselors. If you find yourself in that situation today, like, let me just go ahead and say, I'd love to tell you and direct you to where it is that you can go. We've got some folks that are around that would be willing to sit down and talk with you. And there are some really good counselors. But here's the thing I want to kind of talk about today. Isaiah said that Jesus isn't going to be called a good counselor. He said that Jesus is going to be called a wonderful counselor. So the question that I have is, what is it that makes Jesus a wonderful counselor? What is it that sets him apart? What is it that allows me to go to him and to receive the help and the grace and that, that I need to make it through some of my most difficult circumstances. And to kind of discuss how Jesus fulfilled that role, today I want to read you just three verses from a letter that was written in the New Testament a few decades after that Jesus had risen from the dead and ascended to heaven. Um, I'd love to tell you who wrote this letter, but we don't really know. It's the letter called Hebrews. And, and in it, the writer is sending this letter out to some Christians that were experiencing some difficult times. They, they were beginning to experience some persecution. They were beginning to experience some ostracization. I'm sorry, I speak for a living. Um, they were ex feeling, uh, beginning to be alienated uh, just a little bit. Um, their futures, their livelihood, their families were beginning to be threatened. And, and the reason, the primary reason that they were experiencing this persecution and this threat was the fact that they were followers of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Rome wasn't a big fan of Christianity at this time. They were a cult. Um, and, and if Christians definitely came out and said, I'm a follower of Jesus, then they uh, could be put to death. They could be tortured. There's all kinds of things that could have gone on to them. And as the pressure kind of was getting ramped up and as the screws of life were kind of getting tightened down on them, uh, what, what, what they began to kind of do is go, well, if Jesus is the reason I'm experiencing this, then the solution is for me to push away from Jesus. Experience is just kind of push back from this. This faith, this practice, maybe it isn't worth it. And the writer of Hebrews directs these three verses at these Christians. And they're three absolute amazing verses that are going to tell us why it is that we shouldn't push back. And why it is, in fact, we should lean into the wonderful counselor. So let's look at Hebrews chapter 4. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there and follow along with me. If you don't, that's totally cool. We'll have all of the words up on the screen. You can follow along with us there. Chapter 4, beginning of verse 14, it says this, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. So, so he says, we're, we need you to hold on. We need you to hold on to the faith that you have. Don't push back from the faith. And here's why. Because Jesus is this great high priest 
that has ascended into heaven. Now, we don't have a high priest system here. We'll talk a little bit more about this in January. He's got to come back and tell you a little bit about how the priesthood kind of worked. But, but the high priest essentially served as this mediator between man and God. He was this individual that, that would come and speak to God on behalf of the people. He was the one that would go into the Holy of Holies once a year and sprinkle the blood over the mercy seat. We'll talk all about that in January. But this was, this was what the high priest kind of did. Jesus now serves as the high priest on our behalf between us and God. In other words, what, what the author of Hebrews is reminding the Christians that read this, what he's reminding us of, is the fact that Jesus has done for us something that no other man could have done. The high priest would minister on our behalf in the temple. Jesus is now ministering on our behalf, on our behalf in the very presence of God himself. Jesus ascended, and to ascend that meant that he had to be born, he was killed, and rose from the dead. In essence, what the writer of Hebrews is pointing us to is the gospel message. In other words, Jesus has done for you what you couldn't do for yourself. Jesus has already dealt with your greatest problems, the problem of death and the problem of sin. Jesus has taken care of it and has ascended to heaven where now He serves as your high priest. He serves as your relationship link between you and God. You see, what the writer of Hebrews wants us to understand, what I want you to understand, is that your circumstances can be incredibly terrible. Your circumstances here on earth can be bad. For your faith or, 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 or for your decisions or whatever it may be, you may find yourself in, in, in less than ideal circumstances. And you, just like the author or just like the, the, the Christians that the writer of Hebrews is writing to, your kind of gut reaction would be to push back from your faith. Isn't that kind of the way that we kind of do it? I mean, just think with me, if you will. When, when things are going really, really well, it is kind of in our first reaction, our gut reaction, it's our knee-jerk reaction, kind of, that, kind of tell everybody else how good things are going or hope that other people notice how things that are going uh, pretty well so that then we can talk about how we made such good decisions or made such good moves and put ourselves in this position so that things would happen really well, right? Maybe you don't do that. Maybe that's, that's just other people. Right? Where things happen well and it's easy for us to kind of pat ourselves on the back and wait for other people to pat ourselves on the back because we made the right moves and did the right thing and made the right decisions so that things go well. But when things go poorly, when things don't go away the way that they're supposed to, when we get bad news from the doctor, when the relationship comes to an end, when the world catastrophe occurs and the hurricane hits or the tidal wave hits or, or the gunman comes in and opens fire, don't don't we always kind of want to ask this question? Where's God in all that? Where's the good in all that? See, it's natural for us to kind of go, when things are good, look at the decisions I make. But when things are bad, to go, look what God has done. Or why hasn't God done something? Or why isn't God at work in all of this? Or where is God in all of this? And what the author of Hebrews wants you, 21st century Christians, and 1st century Christians to understand is this. He is always where he's been, and that is on his throne. He is always there listening to us, hearing for us. He is always at work. And the reason we know he's always at work is because he's already dealt with our two greatest problems, the problem of sin and the problem of death. In other words, he has secured for us our eternity so we can trust him with our present. We've secured, he's secured for us our eternity if we can trust him with our present. So don't push back, he says, because we have Jesus as a high priest. And then he takes it to the next level. Verse 15, he says this. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one in Jesus who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, and yet did not sin. Here, he's going to talk about something that is so important for you and for me to understand. So important for you and me to remember. The summer after my freshman year of college was a very difficult time for me. It's like an 18 year old kid. Um, I had just ended a year and a half long relationship with my high school sweetheart. I know some of y'all have married your high school sweethearts, and that's awesome. That is not my story. My relationship with my high school sweetheart was very, very bad. 
from the very beginning. It was like, it was toxic, and, and, and we, we were just not a good couple together. But for a year and a half, we faked it and made it work, right? And you finally get to the point where you realize, like, we had, we had like, done all, all these things that high school students do. Like, we were going to get married, and we were going to live here, and I was going to do this, and he was going to do that. Like, we'd made all these plans. We'd done all this stuff. Like, you know how 18-year-olds are. Anyway, so we had... Um, no offense, you're Anyway, we, we, uh, we had made these decisions, we'd done these plans, and all of a sudden the relationship was just over. You begin to do things when you end that relationship. Some of you guys understand this. You begin to do things like say things like, well, that's probably the best I'll ever do. You know? Well, I'll never find any other girl to date ever in my life. And you know, you kind of get into that self wallowing, kind of pity kind of thing. I can remember, like, like I was, I, one day I was sitting out on the back porch at my house. And uh, just kind of in one of these kind of just, you know, reflective, self-pity kind of places that you get to when you're that age. And, and um, I was sitting out there and my dad came out. Now, I had spent most of my life at this point convincing myself that my father knew absolutely nothing of what he was talking about. Right, my dad um, had had, which is most of us do that with our dads. My dad was a farmer, and, and so he worked a lot from sun up to sundown. He wasn't around a whole lot. This particular day, the sun was setting. He had gotten home early. Uh, it was during the summer, and, and he comes out and he sits down with me. And he just says, "Hey, Jared." He, he was one of the few that called me, Jared. Jared, what's going on? And I said, "Well, Dad, I'm really struggling with this." He said, "Well, tell me about it." So I began to kind of tell him, you know, my my woe is me story about this relationship ending and what this girl had done. She was dating other people. I just found out she was dating other people, and that just didn't seem right because I was dating other people yet. And um, and so I was having some problems and my dad my dad sat across me and he made this statement. It was so great. He said, listen, I know how you feel. It was amazing. He didn't try to he didn't try to like tell me how stupid I was for feeling that way. He didn't try to tell me how silly it was that I was feeling that way. He looked at me and he said, I, I know how you feel. Let me tell you my story. So he told me his story about his high school sweetheart, what happened in that relationship, and really how that relationship was very similar to the one I had just gotten out of, and really how, how his had kind of gone to, the, to this next level, and it was really even so much worse when it was over, and, and how long it took him to kind of get over that. And, and you might kind of feel like that was bad, but for me, I sat across my dad going, for 18 years you had this wisdom. You haven't told me about it, right? And now you, you know, and I can remember sitting there and I listened to my father and my dad and I made this connection on our back patio at my house and it was this connection. He knew what I was feeling. He knew because he had been there. He didn't just sympathize with my emotions. Sympathizing meaning like, like he, he had pity on me. Oh, you poor man that just ended a relationship with a girl. That, that's one thing. He was able to empathize with me. He was able to feel with me. And that meant so much more to me. This, this is remarkable. Because what, what the writer of Hebrews tells us about Jesus is this. This high priest that we have, Jesus, he is able to understand what it is we're going through. And the reason he's able to understand what it is that we're going through is because he has experienced it. He has been tempted in every way. At one point, we're told he's tempted for 40 days by Satan himself. That's remarkable. And yet he's without sin. Jesus understands. He knows what it's like to suffer loss of a loved one. He knows what it's like to have nothing because he's experienced that. He knows what it means to be hungry or hot or cold or, or, or to not know. He knows where you are. In fact, this, this principle has, has really, without even me knowing it, has driven me in, in, into, in, for, for the majority of my life. I can remember at about 12 years old, I was in the sixth grade. I got a, a letter, a phone call from the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. And they knew that I had this, this uh, immune deficiency, and it's called chronic granulomatous disease, and there were some doctors up there that were doing research on it. And they were going to test a new medicine on, the, on my disease and see if it would boost my immune system. And, and they needed patients with, with CGD to come in and be guinea pigs. 
And so, so they called me and they said, would you be willing to do it? And, and my mom hung up the phone and she sat me down and we talked and we prayed about it. But here was the driving force for me. I had a two-year-old cousin um, at the time. I still had the cousin. He was 10 years younger than me. <clears throat> and he had the same disease that I had. Still has the same disease that I had. And I can remember thinking at, at 12 years old, man, if I can go through this and get this medicine approved by the FDA, if I can go through this and participate in this trial, and it makes his life just a little bit easier, it makes his life just a little bit better, he doesn't have to go through some of the stuff that I went through, then absolutely, I want to do that. And so at 12, I began going at least once a year, if not two or three times a year, to the NIH so they could poke and prod and inject stuff in me and, and, and shoot me up with drugs just, just because I thought, man, I'm willing to go through something so that maybe somebody else doesn't have to. We fast forward a few years to when I was in college. In the summers, in between college semesters, I got to operate uh, in the uh, clinical virology lab at Vanderbilt University uh, where I was working with viruses. And so I was like playing with bugs all day and, and, and it's really kind of cool stuff. We'll have to talk about it sometime. But, but while I was up there, I can remember one day I, I got a phone call. And Vanderbilt had been the, the hospital that I had been diagnosed in, the hospital I had been treated in as a child. And, um, and it even was currently being treated in. And, and I get this phone call, and it's one of my doctors. It's one of my doctors that's working on the research floor that I'm working on. One of my doctors that sees me in the clinic. One of the doctors that knows all of my three different volumes of, of medical files, all of that. He calls me up, and he says, Jeremy, I'm over in the hospital. The hospital is just next door to my building. I'm over in the hospital. I need you to do me a favor. I went, well, sure. What, what do you need to do? He said, I need you to come over here. I need you to, first of all, this is kind of funny. I need you to put on a lab coat, Colton, you understand this. I need you to put on a lab coat, and I need you to come over here. And I said, well, what do you need? He said, we've got this patient who's five years old who's got your disease. And he's laying here in a bed. And listen, he's going to have the struggles that you have with the disease, but right now he's just battling an infection. He's going to be fine. He's going to be okay. He's going to be out of here in a few days. But his mom is just freaking out. His mom can't, is just really having a hard time. Here's her five-year-old child, and this is something I don't, I don't understand, but, but he's a five-year-old child, and he's there in the room, and she can't fix him, and she's having trouble with the prognosis, and she's having some issues with this, and, 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 and here's what I want. This, this doctor was really smart. This doctor said, here's what I want. I want you to go over there, and I want you to talk to them, because I think it will do her some good. To see somebody that's in college and is successful, somebody that's here working at the hospital, who has been where her son is laying. I think that'll help. So I put on a white lab coat, and I walked over, and I went into that room, and I listened to her talk. And then I shared with her some of my stories. Some of the things that I had been through were so similar, if not identical, to what he was going through. I gave her my mother's contact information. said, you need to call my mom. She's sat where you sit. But listen, listen, look. It's okay. It's okay. And I was able to talk with her, and I was able to pray with her. And I was able to do that from a position that that doctor couldn't do it from. I was able to do it from a place that no other doctor on that floor could do. In fact, that day, here's what I decided. That day when I decided every time I go somewhere and they poke or prod me or stick a tube in me or give me some kind of medicine or run me through some kind of procedure or give me some kind of operation, here's what I ask the doctor or here's what I ask the nurse or here's what I ask the tech. This is what I say to them. I go, listen, have you ever had this procedure done? And here's why I ask it. Because I want to know if you're able to empathize with me. Do you know how this feels? Do you know what it's like to lay here in this bed? Every now and then I find somebody that's been where I've been, that, 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 that has felt what I feel. And let me tell you, when I find that, it's like a life preserver in a sea because I'm able to grab a hold of that and go, hey, you're not just having pity on me. You're feeling with me. And that makes the difference. That makes all the difference. Now, here's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. This is so important. When you go to Jesus, <laughs> he's not just a good counselor that's going to feed you some stuff from books or from other people's experiences or from even his own mistakes. He's a wonderful counselor who has stood where you stand, who has felt what you feel. 
who has been tempted in the ways that you have been tempted and yet is without sin. We don't have to learn from his mistakes. We get to learn from his successes. He gets to point to himself and go, don't just do as I didn't do, which is what I get to say, right? Don't make the same mistakes I made. He gets to say this, imitate me. Do it like I did. And can I tell you something? When you find a counselor that's been through what you've been through, when you find a counselor that's suffered in the ways that you've been through, that's not just a good counselor. That is a wonderful counselor. So what then? So what should we do? I love this. Look at the last verse. Then we're done. I'm going to go fast. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and help find and, and find grace to help us in our time of need. So, because God has been where we, Jesus has been where we are, we then should approach the throne of grace. We should go to Him, not like with some kind of sanitized little prayer, like we like to pray to God sometimes, but with confidence and boldness, and with and with a gusto that knows He understands. He's listening. He understands. And I'm going to go to the throne of God and I'm not going to fear His judgment because I'm going to view His throne as a throne of grace. He is going to pour out His grace on me because He empathizes with me, because He hears my prayers and feels what I feel. So we ought to lean into that, writer of Hebrews would say. Don't push back from that. But lean in. I can remember not too long ago, uh, Jody and I were, were out somewhere, and I was just mad. You were, mad is my default emotion, okay? Like, when I'm scared, I get mad. When I'm embarrassed, I get mad. When I'm afraid, I get mad. It's just, brr, I'm just mad. I don't even... And I was just mad. I was just hacked off. I don't know if you've ever felt that. And Jody recognized it. She said, hey, you know, something's wrong with you and um, everybody else is noticing. <laughs> like, you know, I wasn't being a jerk. I just wasn't talking to anybody. You know. I said, I know. I, I, don't, I'm just, I don't know how to fix it. I'm mad. And I'm, and I, I, just, I just can't do it. And, and I just got to be honest. I wish that God did this more to me. But there was this moment where I was just like, I got to get home. Here's why I had to get home. I, I, I needed to spend some time praying to God. I needed to go to His throne of grace. And, and I, I'm not disciplined enough to be able to like say my prayers in my head because I have like ADD like, like stuff. So like, actually it's ADOP if you ever had that. It's called ADOP. Like, you know, you, just, you, can't, you can't, I can't stay focused and so I start praying about something and then my mind goes somewhere else and the next thing I know, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm surfing the internet and reading about Alexander the Great. So, um, so I, I, I had to write down my prayers. Like I have to, I have to write down my prayers. And so I was like, I gotta get home. So we got home, and 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 Jody just went to go handle the girls. And I sat down at the room table, and I just opened up my journal, and I began to write. And 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 I, I won't tell you everything that I wrote, but it basically went like this: God, I'm mad. And I don't really know why, but I'm mad. At, I'm mad at my wife, and and I'm mad at you. I'm at this person, I'm at that person, and I just laid it all out. I mean, here's what I am, here's what I feel, all the feelings, all the emotions. And I didn't go to the throne of grace with, 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 like, <laughs> with, with like some kind of sanitized prayer that sometimes we want to get up and pray when we're praying in front of other people. I went, I went to God's throne going, I'm hacked off, God, and on some level I think it's your fault. And I know I shouldn't be thinking that, and I know, I know that it's not your fault, but that's, that's where I am right now. And you want to know what happened in that moment? I just, I'm just telling you, you know what happened in that moment? God didn't change my circumstances, not one bit. But immediately He changed my heart. I can't even tell you how it happened. But as I was finishing that prayer, as I was writing it, I could feel this peace coming over my heart. And as I, as I was doing that, I remembered this passage. And I remember thinking, He knows what it's like to be mad. He knows what it's like to struggle with that temptation. He's done it perfectly. <laughs> I'm not doing it so perfectly, but He knows. And I think He wants you to know that He knows. 
I think he wants you to be willing to go, God, here I am. All of the warts and the cuts and the bruises and the anger and the frustration. Here is my, my bold, confident, all of it kind of prayer. Here's where I am and here's where I'm struggling. And the thing that I think he wants us to understand is that when we come to God with that, <laughs> he doesn't pronounce on us this wave of judgment. How dare you? No, no. See, my Savior, the wonderful counselor, he looks at us and goes, I get it. I know. I know. It's hard. Circumstances are not what you I know. I know. So here's my piece. The wonderful counselor is a counselor that communicates from a position of understanding. Yeah, that's what makes Jesus one counselor. Today, I want to invite Matt back up because I want to ask us to do something. Today, what I'd like us to do is, is I'd like us to just kind of sit for a minute and, and ask ourselves, what is it? In fact, you probably don't even have to ask. What is it inside of me that's, that's just not right? What, what is the circumstance that, that is surrounding me, that, that is causing me to want to push back. To push back from community. To push back from faith. To push back from God. Where is it that I'm wrestling? What decisions am I struggling with? And, and, and who is it that I can go and talk to about that? I wonder if today, if we would just begin by going to God with those prayers. Taking Him to His throne of grace with confidence, knowing that not only does He hear us, but He understands where we are. Knowing that He can, He, he is not just can, but is willing to hear all of the garbage, all of the misunderstanding, all of the hurt, all of the anger, all of the frustration. And Matt's going to sing, and as he sings, I just want to invite you to go wherever it is you need you, you, can, you can pray to God right there at your seat. If you need to kneel at your seat, you can do that. If you want to come up here to this stage and make it an altar today and come and pray to God. If you need to walk around the room or go into one of these classrooms back here or go outside, whatever it is, this is between you and God, where you can just take a moment and go, God, here I am. Here is all of my stuff. And I know I can bring it to you. We know we can bring it to him. And we know that when we do, he understands. He pours out his grace on us. He may never change our circumstances. He can transform our hearts. So would you bow your head right now? As Matt, the band plays, would you go to the Lord?